now I don't make any promises this morning other than, um, you know, the only promise I make is that I'll listen to the voice of the Holy Ghost. Amen. The reason why I say that is because, you know, I've been preaching since Thursday, and, uh, and I just am so, I feel like a high-tension wire, you know? Back in Texas, they used to call me a high wire, you know, that high wire, you know? Some of y'all get that later, but did you know? It's, <laughs> you grab that wire, yeah, huh? <laughs> and we're going to get some power. <laughs> and hopefully we won't be shipping your saddle home, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but you grab that wire, and I feel like I've plugged into and tapped into the presence of God uh, over these last few weeks and days, and I'm just kind of, I'm just bubbling over. So, you know, stay with me this morning, and let's um, see where the Lord takes us. We are going to go back to the book of Hebrews. The one thing I've been mindful about in teaching from Hebrews is how it the writer of Hebrews, I believe it to be the Apostle Paul, just from the language of it, but, but you may believe something else, that's fine. But the writer of Hebrews is able to intertwine the message of the gospel in such a way that he brings many of the books of the Bible to bear. He certainly talks about the characters of the Bible that many of us don't really always understand or know. So today we're going to get into this just a little bit deeper from the sixth chapter of the book of Hebrews. And I want you, I'm going to invite you to turn there. Hebrews, the sixth chapter. Hallelujah. How many of you have been reading ahead of me? Glory to God. Got one or two? Starting to get there. The more I say it, the more you'll do it. Amen. I'm going to remind you, get in there, read ahead, read ahead, see why the Lord is spending so much time on getting his church ready. Hallelujah. My wife and I were talking coming back or while we were there in Dubuque on uh, the last couple of days, and she said to me, she said, do you notice how the theme even of the, of the minister's conference that we were at and the theme of the, of the uh, spiritual gifts conference that we were at over the weekend, do you notice how uh, it's all lining up to be the same sort of messages? And we as believers told you last week that we need to have a greater spirit of discernment, of understanding, Amen. We have to recognize, man, you know, uh, I'm here to tell you, and we're going to talk about it today, God don't lie, and he don't exaggerate. Are you with me? What he says is going to happen. He's proven it, and we need to be aware, and we need to be astute, you know, that's a word we don't use much, but we need to be focused in on what God is doing, amen? amen. So let's read here and see where the Holy Spirit takes us. From Hebrews, the sixth chapter, I'm going to read from the expanded Bible. I'll invite your attention to the 16th verse this morning. It says, people always use the name of someone greater than themselves when they swear. I'm reading from the expanded Bible. The oath proves that what they say is true, and this ends all arguing. Greatest, greatest illustration we can have of that is in courtrooms or courts of law in our modern-day legal system. Amen? And then we know that people still sit up on the stand and lie. Isn't that right? Come on, talk to me this morning, isn't that right? Okay, verse 17 says, God wanted to make very clear to those who would get what he promised that his purposes never change. So he made an oath. Verse 18, these two things cannot change. God cannot lie when he makes a promise, and he cannot lie when he makes an oath. These things greatly encourage us who came to God for safety to hold on to the hope that we have been given. Verse 19, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul. Sure and strong, it enters behind the curtain in the most holy place in heaven where Jesus has gone ahead of us. It goes on to say, and for us, he has become the high priest forever, a priest like Melchizedek. Now, take a look with me real quick at verse 19. Are you there? It says, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul. It's sure and strong. It, do you see that? My Bible says it. It enters behind the curtain in the most holy place in heaven. What does your Bible say? What does it, somebody, what? Huh? One which enters. Who else says something different? What I'm getting, what I want you to see is that it there refers to Jesus. Huh? Jesus has entered in to the most holy place 
on behalf of each one of us. When the Bible says that that hope is an anchor of the soul, it is another name for Jesus. Jesus is the anchor of our soul. Are you with me? Now, that's important because, see, in order for Jesus, some people might think that Jesus, you know, well, it's Jesus. If I said, well, Jesus did something, you say, well, you know, Pastor Tommy, that's Jesus. But it wasn't just Jesus that, that did it, huh? It wasn't just to Jesus that the promises that God made were for. Galatians tells us what? That these promises were made to the seed, uh, singular, of Abraham. Huh? And he goes on to make a big push to let us know that it wasn't just for Jesus that he was making these promises, but rather it was for everybody, that's you and I, that would come after him in faith to believe that what God promised to Abraham, Jesus stood on it and you can stand on it. Can you say amen to that? Now, again, I want to, I, I just, that's, you can go study, re, I've got them down here, I'm trying to, I want to I be disciplined today better than I have been. Galatians 3, matter of fact, you need to go read the book of, entire book of Galatians and, and come to a great revelation. I've heard, I heard one preacher say that Galatians is like the Christian's covenant. It's like the, 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 the um, um, what's our, our constitution. This is what we get. In Galatians, we get this. We get whatever was promised to Jesus, we get. Huh? When the Bible says that curses everyone that hangs on the tree, that the blessing of the Lord, the blessing of Abraham might come upon them that believe, that means you and I don't have to live under a curse. Galatians 3. Huh? So we have to understand that. I might touch on it a little bit today, but that's not my focus this morning. I want to go in a different direction. So let's look back. I want to read. Let's go back to verse 16 for a minute. Hebrews 6 and 16. And I'm going to read this from the King James and the Amplified Bible. It says, for men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. Who here has been through confirmation? Anybody been through confirmation? Okay, all right. That's what this is all about. As much as anything, that's what this is all about. Now, it's not the same depending on what denomination or reformation. But what the Lord does is he confirm. he has to confirm his word, because if he doesn't confirm his word, people won't, won't trust it. Come on. We talked last week about those people that lie. You know, there's some people that open their mouth and you know a lie is coming out. And when you know there's a lie coming out, you just kind of tune out everything else. Isn't that right? Well, God is, is, that's not God. But because our society has come to a place of thinking that, you know, well, I don't know if I can trust you. I had a conversation with a pastor yesterday, a very disturbing conversation. But he was true. I mean, he was telling me the truth. It was very disturbing. He said the reason why, you know, uh, churches, in his estimation, churches are the way they are is because pastors don't trust anybody. And they certainly don't trust each other. Hmm? Now, God is not the author of distrust. If I'm not trusting somebody, then something's wrong in my life. Mm, I wish I had time. I don't have time. So what God does is he confirms his word to give you an anchor to know that if you trust your very life to him, he'll keep you. You can trust him. It's not moving. My sons, my sons and I were on, the, I think I said this last week, I don't know, or not too long ago. My sons and I went fishing on the uh, Wisconsin River uh, back in September. Well, we're not river fishermen, okay? We're lake fishermen, you know. We're learning. We're going to have to learn if we're going to get better, right? And so we're out there, and we threw the anchor out. <laughs> and the anchor held, but it held so good it wouldn't let go. I wish TJ was here. TJ was the one pulling the anchor. But he couldn't. He, so, you know, I'm, I'm dad, you know. TJ's pulling the anchor, man. He's pulling the anchor. And the current, you know, if you've been on the river, the current's moving. And so he's pulling. He's like, and TJ's not a small guy. I mean, you know, he's a strong guy. He could not get that anchor loose. Remember, he could And so, so then, you know, here comes dad, you know. Mm. Yeah. So dad, Okay, just, and we're, there's four of us in the, it was a good, good enough boat to fit four of us, so I, okay, well, let me get up there, you know, and I'm moving around so I can, and I'm 52, so I'm crawling. <laughs> anyway, you have to be in the boat to know. So I, I kind of crawl on my knees to get to the front, and TJ shifts to the back because we're trying to keep the weight balanced. And so I get to pulling on that anchor, man. And I ain't no small guy. I said, I ain't no small guy. I was pulling that anchor. I could not get that anchor to budge. I couldn't get it to move. I was shocked. 
And so we had to call the, the, the rental place to, to have them come up and send a, send a, you know, a rescue ship. You know, I don't know. <laughs> You know, we, and we're not supposed to tell this stuff, I know, but you know. So he, the guy comes up, and he brings his boat up, and he latches his boat on to the anchor line. And he starts pulling away. He couldn't get it to move either. <laughs> and you know what the Lord said to me? Just See, the Lord talks to me like and, and stuff like that. He said, Jesus, the anchor of your soul, will never get moved. I don't care what they hitch up to him. I don't care what kind of unbelief they attach to him. I don't care what direction the world gets in. That anchor is not moving. Huh? I thought that was pretty cool, the Holy Spirit. We fired, obviously, we got it moved because we're here today. Amen? <laughs> anyway, let me keep going. So he goes on to say in verse 17, wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto, unto the heirs of promise the immutability. And there's that word. I'll define it in just a second. Immutability. We don't use that. I hope you don't use that in everyday language. Um, of his counsel confirmed it by an oath. Verse 18 says that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope that set before us. The word immutable, very simple, from the 18, Webster's 1828 Dictionary, is invariable, it's unalterable, it is not capable or susceptible of change. Okay? Read that again. Invariable. Huh? We hear that word in association with the Lord. Huh? God who makes promise unto men. He doesn't change. He doesn't, he doesn't vary. He doesn't waver. Goes on to say unalterable. An unalterable document in, 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 in performing marriage ceremonies, when I, have a, when I get the license before me, the paperwork for it, the, it says at the bottom of the license that if this document is altered in any way, it's void. Huh? Think, some things are unalterable. Some things used to be unalterable. Like a promise between a man and a woman that I love you forever. Yeah, I ain't gonna talk to me. Okay, okay. So some things used to be unalterable, like the promise, excuse me, that when you are on a job, that you can stay on that job for 20 years and, and, and you can have some security. Those things were, if they used to be unalterable, then they were never, never really what they appeared to be. But with God, huh? I'm getting ahead of myself. He himself is the one that everything rests on. I'm going to stop right there because I don't want to get ahead of myself. He's the, rock. He's the rock. Thank you, sir, that we've been talking about. Let's keep going. Verse 19 says, or excuse me, let me, let me skip down. I want to read this from the Amplified Bible. <laughs> Men indeed swear by a greater than themselves. And with them in all disputes, the oath taken for confirmation is, is final. Accordingly, verse 17 says, God also in his desire to show more convincingly and beyond doubt to those who were to inherit the promise, the unchangeableness of his purpose and plan intervened with an oath. Verse 18 says, this was so that by two unchangeable things, his promise and his oath, in which it is impossible for God ever to prove false or deceive us, we who have fled, you need to make a mark by that in your Bible. We who have fled to him for refuge might have mighty indwelling strength and strong encouragement to grasp and to hold fast the hope appointed for us and set before us. Amen? So my purpose today in talking to you is to understand, get you to understand the immutability or the unchangingness of God's plan and purpose. How many of you know, and you may not know this, and you may, this may be part of your struggle. Excuse me. This may be part of your struggle. You may not know that God has a plan for your life. Amen. And if you don't know that God has a plan for your life, chances are that you will never, ever reach the potential or the, the, the destination or the destiny for which God created you. Huh? You have to know this. You have to know this. You, you were not, help me, Lord. You were not created to work a nine-to-five job. Now, I ain't telling you go out and quit your job. I didn't say that. Don't, don't tweet that Pastor Tommy said he quit your job, y'all. 
You were not created to see how much money you could make. Blessed quietness. You, you, you were created to come to a place of understanding that God had intended in your life before you were birthed into this realm to go out and do great exploits on behalf of the kingdom. You are an ambassador for Christ. Now, if you're not born again, remember I told you to put a mark or underline, we who have fled, not everybody has fled to God. I said not everybody has fled to him. And what that means is that I have encamped, I have taken not only my life, but I have taken her life and his life and his family's life and my other son's family's life and my daughter's life who's now in heaven with him and all of the children and the seed that will come through the line of Tommy Roberts and we have placed our stake in the kingdom of God. And we have bet our lives that what God said he would do, he would do. Mm -hmm. When you make the decision for righteousness, you're not doing it for you as much as you might think. When you make the decision, when, 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 the, when Joshua stood up in the Old Testament and it was time for Joshua to lead the people, Joshua makes a declaration. He says, how long will you stand here between two mind thoughts? He said, between two opinions. And what it means is how long are you going to stand here debating on whether or not you're going to serve God or serve, serve the enemy? Huh? And as an Old Testament character, he understood that there, there was just something about when God speaks to your heart and when God tells you something, that you can take what God says to the bank. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, the challenge with this is this. Most people, the reason why they don't trust God is because their own words are no good. Yeah. Yeah. You can get many amens on that one. I cannot, I'm just going to let my spirit flow this morning. Can I do that? I cannot, stand up, dear heart, spend 30 years with this woman, and we find fault with one another. Now, I'm, I'm, I, this is not condemnation. Listen to the whole story. We have spent 30 years together. And I wake up one day and I say, you know what? I want a newer model. Yeah. Let me sit down. Thank you. I want a newer model. A lot of miles on that one. Huh? huh? Listen. And then I find a newer model. <laughs> now, everything that we shared and every decision that we make affects him. And so now he has, he has a dilemma and a, and a, a situation. <laughs> he got a situation. And the situation that he has was not created by him. And so now he has to balance his life, his allegiance, his loyalty and love between her and me. Because I wanted something new. And you know, I, I'm really, I'm entitled to whatever I want. Because, you know, because I am a man now, you know. I, yeah, the, the Lord will give me the desires of my heart. Hallelujah. Amen, somebody. Now, it would be, it, it's, it's, it's a ridiculous example for she and I, because that ain't never going to happen. I said that ain't never going to happen. Y'all don't, don't get it. That ain't never going to happen. And I can say that with such surety and clarity because we have made a decision that the same anchor that holds our soul holds our word. Yeah. Yeah. And that word is not going to be let go just like my soul is not going to be let go. When I make a decision, I'm making it before heaven and earth. Amen? Amen. And I commit and covenant with her right. that that ain't going to happen. Yes. Now, the challenge with that is that it would be ridiculous, but I know preachers right now. And you do too. You know, it may not be a preacher. You know people right now that that happens all the time. And so, listen, I want to get back to where I was going. So with that, now because I have a new model, I've been... <laughs> uh, 
did y'all hear that? He said, you're broke. Oh, the mercy. Only, only a life point, man. I tell you what. Eh? <laughs> yeah, amen. So, so, so with that, I got the new model. And now all of the things that I spent 30 years, she and I spent cultivating between one another, where they going to go? Do they just disappear? They're there. And this new model that I got now, now I'm bringing not only my 30 years with her, but my 25 years with him, my 30 years with my other son, or 29, 30 years with my other son, and 30, yeah, and, and everything else that goes along with it. And all of that is trailing behind me into this next, next covenant that I'm making with this new model. Now, she don't know that. Because I ain't telling her all that. Oh, yeah, OK. What I'm telling her is, I love you. I want to be with you. You fulfill me. You complete me. She didn't understand me. She's just old fashioned. Huh? And God, who I love dearly, I say I love him. Now, as a preacher of the gospel, we got a dilemma. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we got a real dilemma. And my dilemma is not just my own. Who's other, who else's dilemma is it? It's the church's dilemma. Because the church now has a decision to make. Are they going to stick with me because I preach real good or whatever? Because I don't think I preach that good. I ain't even scratched the surface. I'm just learning how to do this. Are they going to stick with me because we got, we got a thousand members and, you know, it must be doing something right? Or are we going to go back to what we know that God said about his word that God doesn't lie, nor does he change? If his purpose was for the joining, listen to me well, if she and I, when we got joined together, connected by covenant, if we were joined together by God at his intent, then there is nothing, I don't care what we do, that can break the covenant except our own wills. God don't change. God doesn't change. Now, I say this just to clarify. Not everybody that gets married to their spouse asks God's permission. You got a dilemma. I don't know why I'm here, but I'm here now. Because I want you to see that with God, the Bible says that God can't lie. In, 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 in studying this, the Lord said, I want you to, he said, you have to bring out the point of understanding that Satan is the father of lies. Yeah. Yeah. In other words, lies did not exist. Listen, the lie itself did not, a lie, a lie, the concept of lying did not exist until after Adam and Eve ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They didn't even know what a lie was. They didn't know. Because they didn't lie to each other, right? The lie shows up by the spirit of deception, okay? That's what a lie is rooted in, deception. We want to deceive. Come on now. So the lie shows up. The first time we see it is when Adam... And Eve, come before, when the Lord comes looking for them, and he says, Adam, where art thou? And Adam comes forth, and they say, we hid ourselves. And the Lord was like, well, why did you hide yourself? Because we're naked. Who told you you were naked? Huh? And what had happened? Deception had entered into their heart, and they didn't even have to spend time thinking about it. They automatically tried to hide behind their environment and their surroundings. I told you this before, just by way of understanding. What did Adam do when he sinned, and how did he, what did he dress himself in? Fig leaves. Do you understand this? God did not dress him in fig leaves. Huh? God had to kill an animal to dress him. Listen to me. But what happens with Adam, Adam, and this is what happens with deception, this is what happens when our word does not carry the weight that it should in our understanding, in our own thinking, Adam tries to hide behind the environment in which he's in. 
So what Adam does, he looks around the Garden of Eden, he sees nothing but green and all this luscious growth and everything, and he says what? You know what? I want to look like them now. So he puts on some fig leaves because he thinks that God won't see him in his deception. Are you with me? So what God does, God doesn't condemn. God did not condemn Adam and Eve, did he? He kicked them out. He banished them from the garden, but that was for their own protection. Because had they at this point entered, not, now they're in the garden, they are the stewards. Can I tell you that you are the steward of your own life? Yeah. What you allow to enter into your heart is what's going to come out of your heart. If you don't somehow or another stop garbage entering into your heart, garbage will always come out your life at the other end. And so what he does is he takes Adam, he, he says, you know what, got to go. Because I don't want you, God's love is so amazing, remembered by two immutable things, two things that don't change. God had purpose for Adam to be the steward or the manager of mankind, the manager of the earth, and it never has changed. So he takes him and he says, you got to go. He places an angel of the Lord in the garden that guards the tree of life. Why is that important? Because if Adam, with this sin now entered into his heart, goes up and he and Eve eat from this tree, it will be impossible for, for man to be redeemed from unrighteousness. Sin will lock into the nature of human beings, and there is no hope once that happens. Now, stick with me, because what, what, what I'm trying to get you to see is that God's plan for mankind never changed. Jeremiah 29 11, don't turn there, write it down. <laughs> God through Jeremiah says, I know the thoughts that I have for you. You need to stop reading the Bible as if it's some good storybook and all you read, you're reading Daniel and you hear about Daniel, you're reading Jeremiah. He wasn't talking to Jeremiah, he was prophetically talking to you and I. He knows the thoughts that he has towards Tommy. Thoughts of good and not evil. Thoughts of hope in my final outcome. Thoughts of good that he has towards me. You need to say, God knows the thoughts that he has for me, Lynette. God knows the thoughts that he has for me, Annie, and, and so on. you got to make it personal. And what you're trying to do is you're out here trying to make something happen that God didn't expect you to make happen. He expects him to make it happen because it is Christ in you, the Bible says, that is your hope of glory. Huh? And your struggle is not in your, oh, I'm so bad, I'm such a bad person, I'm so, I'm so up and down. No, you're not. The nature of who you are is designed to, to you've got to have God on board. That's the only way this works. Oh, hallelujah. So what God does now is he keeps his plan in line with what he's already said. Titus 1, put it up on the board, Titus 1. Are you Okay. Titus 1, verses 1 through 3. It says, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness. He goes on to say, in hope, verse 2, of eternal life. How many of you have a hope of eternal life? Can I tell you that eternal life and you're living in it right now? Wish I could get that in you. You are living in it right now. Guy asked me the other day, he said, he said so how do, you like, how do you like what you do? I said, man, man, are you kidding me? I was born for this. That don't make it easy. Most of us want it to be easy. Do you not know that the kingdom of God is not designed to be easy? <laughs> Did you really think that? Did you really think that this was going to be easy? Why is it not easy? Because there is a separation that must come between sheep and goats. There is a separation that must come between wheat and tare. This whole thing is, is all about separation and preparation. This is a holding tank until we get to be with him eternally in glory. And anybody that's trying to live a life that's not measuring up, they ain't going to make it. And you know what? You know, I, I, it, it, it amazes me when people think, you know, uh, you know, well, I don't come to church because they talking about me. 
They talk about you out there all day. You don't quit your job. Huh? And what makes you think you're not going to get talked about in it? They talk about me. I just laugh at them. First of all, I don't read it. <laughs> I don't pay no attention to it. Because I don't do this for them. I do this for God. <laughs> anyway. So the Bible says in hope of eternal life, and you are living in eternal life. I didn't get enough amens. I'm going to make that point again. You know why I say that? Because from this point on, the real you will never die. Yeah, that, yeah that, that, this earth suit, unless the Lord delays his coming, this earth suit is going to get old. It's going to get older. It's going to get older. I remember, remember uh, you know, one of these days, God will give me grace to be able to, to teach on if you don't, if you, if you haven't heard this, you need to go out and buy it. I've got it. Uh, it it's, a, it's a series. Uh, matter of fact, my wife and I had gone down to Branson um, a couple years ago uh, on our vacation. We went down there and stopped by a gentleman by the name of Keith Moore's church. And he was talking about death. But he was talking about death from the faith standpoint. Do you not know that people leave here at such a rate? And every time I snap my fingers, I think he said two. Was it two? Two more. Two, was that in, in there right? Two more. Two more people leaving here. That's how, we, that's how people leave in here. Now, we may, not, we may not get that understanding of it, but I'm here to tell you that this body that you have, because of what Adam did, it is going to, um, again, unless the Lord comes and the Lord takes us as part of his, part of his gathering of saints. We talked about it a couple weeks ago about the rapture of the church. I know rapture is not in the Bible. I'm not going to get into all today. Go back and study the other message. Listen to that. But when he takes us out of here, that's the only way you won't see death. If you're not, if you're not somehow or another in that bunch, <laughs> now let me, I don't know why I'm here, but thank you, Lord. If you're not in that bunch where the church gets raptured, that means you get left behind. And that, that's a good thing. You know why that's a good thing? Because you weren't ready to go anyway. Now, why do you say that's good? Because you don't ever want to meet the Lord and not be ready. His actual, actually, the, 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 the tribulation that will come is actually another form of his grace. Mercy. Because, because if you, for some reason or another, have not figured out, if you, like Joshua said, you are still debating whether you want to live for God or live for yourself, you know, because to live for yourself means you live for the enemy. Yeah. To be clear. If you're doing what you want to do and you haven't surrendered your will to the Lord, you're living for yourself. And ultimately, if you are your own God, you are an enemy of God and you are not accepting a sacrifice, you might as well, you are in league with Satan. Yes. Amen. Somebody got to tell you this stuff. Somebody got to tell you this stuff. And so with that, though, if you get left behind on the first trip, and I'm, I'm being very, very loose with this because I, I, I don't want to stay here, but if you get left behind, that's God's mercy. Baby, I guarantee you, when you don't see, when you see, like, they, you know, the movies will depict it like, you know, somebody, and I guess there's some level of truth to this, somebody driving down the road, and all of a sudden there ain't no car there, I mean, no driver in the car anymore. What you going to do, when you see the clothes down there and you realize that that was somebody, I think if it were me and I didn't go, I'd be on my face before God, repenting. Oh, this really is real. Okay, all right, I ain't getting none. That's not a good topic. Good. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> so you are living an eternal life. And I, that, that's why I was at. And the reason why I say that is because, see, now I am, I am, I, and we've gone, we've gone through this. If you haven't, if this is the first time you've heard this, I'm sorry, but I don't have time to spend time here, but because we've talked about this at length over the last few years. You are a spirit, you have a soul, and you live in a body. That's what you are. The greatest part of you is your spirit. And the part that identifies you from all each, throughout all eternity is your soul. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And so the body is destined to die, and ultimately, one day, the Lord will raise the body up, he will glorify that body, and you get to be three in one again. Hallelujah. So when I get born again, my spirit will never die. And to be clear, when a spirit enters the earth realm, it never dies anyway. It can't die. It can't die. It's been created by God. I said I wasn't going to spend time there. I'm going to keep going. Okay. More to come. 
Buy CD set number. No, I'm kidding. Okay. <laughs> Hebrews 6 and 12. Let's back, let's back up a little bit. <clears throat> Hebrews 6 and 12. That ye be not slothful, we talked about this last week, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Who is the greatest example that we know of in the Bible who inherited through faith and patience? Who would you say? Abraham. Know why it's not Job? Because Job didn't have the same covenant that Abraham had. Huh? Job is actually dated as the oldest book of the Bible. That was not a part of what we call the Torah, the first five books of the Pentateuch. It wasn't a part of that. So Job's understanding, when Job got tangled up with all the stuff going on in his life, when Job got, it was only, actually, it was only a short span of time. It was, it was relatively short. But you know what? Everybody, everybody, what, when I say Job, what do you think about? Suffering. Suffering. Come on. When I say Job, what do you think about? Or his turkey. Or Job's turkey. You ever heard that expression? How does that expression go? Um, as poor as Job's turkey? Y'all never heard that? Ain't nobody ever heard that? That ain't no East Coast expression. Is it? My, I think it's a Southern expression. I think my mama. As poor as Job's turkey. I, am, I can't believe I, I'm the only one that's ever heard that. Google it. <clears throat> anyway. <laughs> but but the, the inference there is that somehow or another, Job, because everybody, when they hear Job, they think suffering and poverty. And he's sitting there hurting. Let's put it like that. But has any, I always wonder when I hear that, has anybody read the, the end of Job? Yeah. Come on. He got short page, so. Huh? Yeah. He got double for everything that he had. Anyway, okay. Yeah, he was. But I don't want to stay there and teach. I want to keep going. <laughs> but but so, so the Bible character that I want you to focus on when we read this be not slothful, but follow them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. When God made promise to Abraham, matter of fact, the Bible answers your question right there. When God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself. Verse 14 saying, surely, say surely, y'all. Blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. God made the promise by his own ability. Let me keep going, because I, I, I do want to get somewhere. Write these scriptures down. I'm not going to turn there, but I want you to write them down for your own reference. Numbers 23, 18 through 20 talks about God, especially 19. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said it, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? In 1 Samuel, write this down, verses 15, 28 through 30. Just write it down. 1 Samuel 15, verses 28 through 30. Huh? And, the, and Samuel said unto him, The Lord hath, hath taken the kingdom of Israel from you this day, and hath given it to a neighbor of yours that is better than you. And also the strength of Israel will not lie nor repent, for he is not a man that he should repent. In other words, God, don't equate God to your own limited understanding or ability of him. He is the strength of Israel. He is the one that people have, throughout generations have relied on to carry out what he said. Every character in the Bible that is spoken of in a positive light has had to trust the same way you're sitting in this chair today, the same way you are hearing the gospel preached to you. They did not get any special dispensation. If anything, you should have more reason to believe in the Lord because Jesus Christ came, was buried, was died, buried, and resurrected. And the Bible says, we read it a few minutes ago, he goes into the most holy place for you and I yeah. to encourage us. Huh? Yeah. So don't think of these folks in the Bible as somebody special. They weren't. If there was a Bible written today being recorded right now in the, in the halls of heaven, what would it say about you? Huh? Huh? What would be your legacy in the word of God? Just a good place to think. Amen? So let's keep going. Turn to Genesis 18. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord. Genesis 18. I want to see if I can bring this out the way the Holy Spirit laid it on my heart. Genesis 18. Verse 16. There's a lot there. Genesis 18, 
Actually, I'm going to back up a little bit. Gentlemen, give me, give me uh, verse 1 of Genesis 18, please, on the board. Genesis 18, verse 1. Give them a second to get there. And then I'm going to skip through. I'm not going to read all of this, but I want to put it, keep it in a better context than 16 is going to allow me. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Okay, if you don't have it, it's on the board. Genesis 18, verse 1, King James. And the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre. He sat in the tent door. Just get ahead of me. In the heat of the day. Okay, who's he talking to? Who's he, who's he, who has he come to visit? Abraham. Okay, now understand this. Understand this. He lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. Do you see that? Now, there are some, if you read the original text, there are some people that tried to suggest and still try to suggest that these were angels. These were not angels. They're not. Read it. Study it out. This was God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit manifested in flesh. There are, I was telling somebody this yesterday, there are only three to four places in Scripture where you see the God had manifested in the earth realm. This is one of them. This is so, listen to me, here's what I take from this. This is so important that God, who creates this earth, shrinks himself down, steps into the earth realm from the spirit realm to convey a message to a man. A man. Are you with me? Now, we think about Jesus, well, the Bible says the word became flesh. Yes, but the purpose of Jesus coming was his redemptive call. That's not what this is. This is information. This is a message that must be, must be dealt with or a situation that must be dealt with. This, so he says, he lifted up his eyes and looked and lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground. Now, there's no indication that he knew who they were. Huh? So why was he running? Because there was something. Listen, listen to me. Just like there's something in you that draws you to God. Something inside of him said, get up and run now. Go and see who this is. And said, my Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. Let a little water, I pray you, be fetched, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree. Keep going. And I will fetch a morsel of bread and comfort your hearts. After that, you shall pass on. For therefore are you come to your servant. And they said, so do as thou hast said. In other words, they, got, they, they came and they, they agreed to come sit and fellowship and sit down and eat a meal with, with Abraham. Yeah. Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah and said, keep going. I want you to skip down to verse 10, please. Can you do that? Keep going. And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life. Now, here is God, again, based on two immutable things, his oath and his word, telling Sarah that not only am I going to give you a son or give you a child, but I am going to return unto you according to the time of life. In other words, she was well past the child-rearing age, but because God is the master of life, what he says goes, he can speak to dead things, and dead things change. Sarah, thy wife shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door. Sarah was listening. She was eavesdropping. You know, I don't know why y'all ladies like to do that. But she was eavesdropping. Look, she justified. Look, she justified. <laughs> I'm just having fun. Y'all put them things back in your purse, okay? Anyway, <laughs> I'm just kidding. And it seems to be with Sarah after the manner of women. Go ahead. Keep going. Verse, yeah. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? And the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did, why did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I, have, shall I of a surety bear a child, which am old? And, and, and in God, if you're not careful, you'll read this like, you know what? The Lord's like, why is she laughing? You know what the Lord, I believe the Lord is saying? Doesn't she know me? You got up and ran to me. Where was she? And we can sit there and try to justify, well, you know, that man I'm married to, and he don't do right and all this kind of stuff. Don't worry about him. You do right. Yes. Is anything too hard for the Lord at the time appointed? I will return unto thee according to the time of life. And Sarah shall have a son. Go ahead. 
Then Sarah denied, saying, I laughed not, for she was afraid. And he said, nay, well, yeah, girl, you did laugh. Keep going. And then the men arose. That's where I want to pick up. And then the men arose up from thence and looked towards Sodom and Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. Now, this is where I want to get to. Verse 17 says, and the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? Seeing that Abraham, he's already, been, he's already declared it. Listen, what God has already declared over your life is just sitting out there waiting for you to get obedient. What God has already promised over your life prophetically, he's just waiting for you to get obedient, not him. He's just waiting for you to believe it, not him. He's just waiting for you to have enough faith, not him. He doesn't have to bring it to pass. It's already been declared from the beginning of the world. So what is, what is Sarah really doing? So, and what is God really doing? God puts the word out there, and again, God cannot lie. If he said it over your life, and you know he said, I knew he called us to be shepherds. I knew it. What I had to do was keep my faith and my patience intact. I did, you know what a lot of people do, though? And how old were we when we started pastoring? 48, right? You know what a lot of people do? They try to help God out. There's evidence of it here. I'm not going to, there's Sarah and Abraham tried to help him out. And what did they do? They created a real, they created a situation. Huh? With Hagar. They created a situation, situation. Huh? And still, yeah. And, it's, and, and part of that is still going on in the earth right now. You don't need to help God out. What you need to do is get obedient. Oh, okay, I'm talking to your neighbor. So tell your neighbor, you need to get obedient. Huh? I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to your neighbor. No, I'm talking to you. Make, see, when I say this, I got to make sure I look at everybody. So he only looked at me. No, I looked at all of you. you need, huh? Don't we really want God's will? How many want God's will? Baby, it gets better than this. We, 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 yeah, it took 40 years. God told me when I was eight years, eight years old, that this is what I called you to do. Now, you think I didn't mind. It was all, yeah. man, I was all over the map. But I never stopped holding on to what he said. And I had to make the decision to stop living ungodly. I had to, I had to make the decision to stop being unrighteous. Huh? Some things don't line up with God's plan for my life. It, don't, it wouldn't be good for me to be in a, in a bar sitting with some lady who ain't my wife. That don't line up with God's plan for my life. Come on, y'all. Watching pornographic movies don't line up with God's plan for my life. Okay. I want God's best. He says here, verse 18, 17, the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? In other words, God's got a plan. He can really do something. I, I, I really, yeah, I got to hurry up, but I really plan on, I want to get this done, get this in. God's got a plan, and his plan, listen, is for Sodom and Gomorrah. Ultimately, that's the plan of God. It's for Sodom and Gomorrah. But he intends to see what Abraham will do about it. God has a plan not only for your life, but for all of the people that you influence. And ultimately, yes, it's their will, and they have to make the decision, but most of the time, God is waiting to see what you're going to do about it. And so when God raises up churches, the purpose of the church, why he raises them up, is to get people out of that old, old, raggedy way of thinking that they just come to church so they can, you know, oh, make me feel good, preacher. Make you feel good. Being good is better than feeling good. Doing good is better than, huh? I can't make you feel good. You know, what you want to start, you talking about, you know, make us shout and dance. No. If you got a shout in your heart and a dance in your heart, you don't need me to help bring it out of you, baby. Huh? You do it anyway. Look, hey, we skip down. I'll be in Walmart. Much as I don't like Walmart, I'll skip down Walmart when the, when the Holy Ghost hit. You know what I'm saying? Verse 18, 
seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. In other words, what I do in Sodom and Gomorrah is going to affect him down the road. So in order before, listen, before God does anything in your life, he's always asking you about it. Some of y'all don't believe that. Well, you know why you don't believe it? Because you don't pray. I'm really having a fit up here. You don't pray. And if you don't pray, how's he going to get an answer to you? Give me a word, preacher. And then we run around the nation, the country, trying to get a word from somebody. Yeah, yeah. I'm preaching better than y'all shouting, but that's okay. <laughs> so he says, verse 18, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, all the nations there shall be blessed in him. For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abram that which he has spoken of him. Verse 20 says, And the Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it. Listen to me clearly. The cry of Sodom and Gomorrah was not the cry of the people. The cry of Sodom and Gomorrah was not the cry of the people. The cry of Sodom and Gomorrah was for all the intended purpose of why God raised up that nation. Are you with me? Are you hearing me? Listen to me well, and I'm going to bring it into context by God's grace. There is a cry that comes up. I'm going to use the state of Iowa. There is a cry. Because, because Sodom and Gomorrah did not start with those inhabitants. Sodom and Gomorrah was birthed into existence by the plan of God because everything God creates, he creates to glorify him. So it was not created to have that kind of sin burden upon it. If I were to take you over to the book of Romans, Romans 8, I think it is. The Bible says that the earth is in travail and in groaning until the manifestation of the sons of God. Huh? And so this that had been created, Sodom and Gomorrah had been created for righteousness and evil had so swallowed it up that God himself had to come down and see, why is Sodom and Gomorrah crying out to me so loudly? For justice, for judgment. And the same thing is true about where we live, where you live. Iowa City, Iowa, Tiffin, Iowa, Corvo, Marion. Huh? Davenport, North Liberty, all of them, I can't name them all. All of them have been created by God to bring God glory and to bless your lives because you are righteous in the midst of them. And when the righteous cease to exist, then sin overwhelms the, the territory and the territory then must be judged. That's what's coming during the time of the apocalypse. That's what's coming during the time of judgment. When the righteous will be lifted out of the earth and the earth will be left to its own spoils. Are you with me? So we hear, we see now. See, it says, and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it which is come unto me. And if not, I will know. He goes on to say, verse 22, and the men turned their faces from there and went towards Sodom. But get this phrase, Abraham stood yet before the Lord. He didn't start the journey with them. He wasn't invited to go along. But the, 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 the impression here is that he stood. It'd be like somebody, stand up, brother. It'd be like somebody, he and I having a conversation. Come here, come here, come here, come here, come here. Hurry up, hurry up. Stay right there. He and I having a conversation. Come here. The three of us, step back just a little bit. I want you to face, face me, face us. You stand right here facing him. Facing him. Boy, you just block out the sun, man. Um, <laughs> so we're standing here having a conversation. He's Abraham. We're talking about the necessity to go to Sodom and Gomorrah. We must go there. It's crying out. Yes. Why are you here? Because you are a friend of God. Because in you rests everything else that I will do. So now, I accept your words 
as much as I accept the word of the rest of the Godhead. What do you have to say? Y'all see that? Abraham stood. We're talking. You ever get the, you ever notice you're standing there talking and somebody else just walk up on you? Can, can I help you? Huh? And he's not moved. Although he recognizes the magnitude of the counsel that's going on, he's not moved. Because God just said that in me will all the nations of the world be blessed. That includes Sodom and Gomorrah. Let me sit down. Thank you. Give him a hand. In me. So then if it, they will be blessed in me, then there's something that I have to say. And as you read the story, he goes on and starts entreating or interceding on behalf. Yes, his nephew was there. But Lot was not a small thinking man. Small minded people only concern themselves with just how it will affect them. Small minded churches never want to reach out beyond their doors because you know what, well, bless God, if they really wanted it, they'd come. Huh? No, they really want it, but more importantly, what does God want? Abraham tapped into what God wanted. That's why God came down. He could have destroyed Sodom from there. He could have judged righteously from there. But he wanted an encounter with the man that he said was going to be the father of many nations. He wanted to come face to face and see once again, what does man have to say about this whole situation? And there you are sitting there saying nothing. You're in the midst of a workplace that's so challenging you just want to quit. You'd rather quit than fight. You got your children out here on drugs, running around, sleeping around, doing things, and you'd rather quit and give up on them than go to God and say, God, you promised them to me. You said that my seed would be blessed. Well, you know, they've been out there a long time. Is there anything too hard for God? He don't care how long they've been out there. Baby, he don't care what persuasion they are. You know, they might be, they might have gender identification issues. They may not know, but you know. Not, not just the fact that you know them, you know God. You know that if you go to God and say, God, I love you. God, I am your child. You raised me up. You cleaned me up. You made me somebody. My word carries authority with you. God, save my children. God, save my neighborhood. Save these folks on my job. Thank you, Lord. Are you all right? Yeah. First, we, we want to think of, of uh, Romans 4, uh, 19. We want to think of, 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 of Abraham as being somehow or another like he was some superhuman, like he had a big S on his or big A on his chest, you know, an A cape or all that kind of stuff. Abraham, as, as much as he got it right, he got it wrong too. Just like you and I. Okay, just like I. <laughs> talking to somebody yesterday, and they were telling me, you know, Pastor, you know, I'm just kind of, you know, I'm, I, I just seem to be in and out, and, and I can't, I just seem to keep making mistakes. Listen to me. That's why, I tell, that's why this scripture is in here, Romans 4, 19 through 21. I'm going to read it real quick from the King James Version. It says, and being not weak in faith, talking about Abraham, he considered not his own body now dead. When he was about 100 years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. Being fully persuaded that that what he had promised, which he had promised, he was able also to perform. It's talking about this same encounter we just read about in Genesis. God promised it. He's he going to do it. And so, so we, we want to think that the Bible doesn't say read it again. It doesn't say that he didn't stagger. What does it mean to stagger? To stagger means that you look at the promise of God and it's so overwhelming and it's so beyond your capacity to be able to bring it to pass. God might have called you to a, to, to a nation. He might have called you to a, to a company. He might have called you to raise up, you know, to finance a certain area of the kingdom. God might call you out here to go out here as, a, as somebody with a, a, a healing ministry or deliverance ministry. God might call you to go out here and to just be a street witness or whatever it is. You look at it and you think, oh my God, I can't do that. Huh? That's unbelief. Abraham looked at it and said, oh, God. Oh. And he, the, 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 the opportunity to stumble and stagger is there. And, and the Bible shows us through many examples that he does. But he doesn't stagger through unbelief. He gets back up and said, you promised it. You called me to do it. And if you called me to do it, you are faithful. You have the word that will never change. You promised me this. And so now I'm still going to do it. That's, that's, that should give everybody in here hope. 
Oh, it's been a long time, Pastor Tommy. Are you dead? If you ain't dead yet, get up. What you waiting on? The Bible says now faith is the substance of things hoped for. Now. Say now. now. Hallelujah. Thank you. Ha ha. Glory to God. Let me close. So, 1 Corinthians, verse 6. Uh, excuse me, chapter 6, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 17. Remember what I told you, God can't lie. 1 Corinthians 6, 17. I'm going to read this from the Amplified Bible. Now, hold your place there. I'm not going to another scripture, but I want you to look up at me after you get it. Because this bears being said because of the time and day that we live in, plus the region that we live in. Bears being said. And I'm, I'm just the man today by the strength and the authority and the anointing of the Holy Ghost to say it. I ain't got no fear. We look at Sodom and Gomorrah. When I say Sodom and Gomorrah, what do y'all think about? <laughs> what else? What else? I'm not talking about a region. I'm talking about what were they known for? Homosexuality. Lesbianism, but particularly homosexuality. Okay? Is that not, a, is that not an issue in our society today? So if I talk about it, if I talk about it, y'all okay with that? I don't, I, I really don't need your agreement. I'm going to talk about it anyway, but I'm going to talk about it from this context. God, <coughs> excuse me, did not go down there to judge their homosexuality or lesbianism. It's <clears throat> not why he went. Think about that for a minute, because that's what we've been taught. He went down there to judge their disobedience, judge their sin. God does not look at sin in degrees. We do that. In other words, <clears throat> I can't pick on anybody. I can pick up my wife. Because <clears throat> she's going to love me whether when y'all stop, she's going to still be there. <laughs> I got gotcha. you. No, just kidding. I'll pick on me. I could sit up here and preach to you. And I know that there's an anointing on my life. I know it. I ain't bragging. I'm just telling you I know it. Because I couldn't do this if I didn't. It's too tough. It's too tiring. It's too it's fatigue, you know. And I could get up here and be living a treacherous life, and you wouldn't know it. Because I could deceive you, especially, especially in our society today, because we have the ability to deceive so good. Huh? And nobody is aware of the deception. And, and to be clear, how many of you know that when people get caught, and I'm just picking on this today just because it's a sin, not because of the magnitude of it or the gravity of it. When people get caught in, 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 in uh, adulterous affairs, the time they got caught is not the time they started. You didn't get caught the first time you did it. Okay. It, 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 exactly. And certainly not the first time you thought it. Because everything starts with a thought, with a seed. You know, if you steal something, I, I remember one time I was a little kid, I stole a, a pack of gum. I felt so guilty, I wouldn't put that gum back. I wouldn't tell my mama, she still beat me. That's the truth. Because she wanted to make sure that I didn't ever get that thought again. So God didn't go down there to judge the, homo, the, the homosexuality. How do I know that? Because again, God didn't have to come down to do it. He could have done it from heaven. He had already judged it. What he came down, more importantly, was to see, number one, what Abraham would do. And then because of what Abraham petitioned him to do, he said, if I can find 50 righteous people, will you destroy it? What was God's response? Okay. You find 50. And you know, you read the rest of the story, he kept going down and down and down and down. And the sad testament to the whole thing is that he couldn't find a righteous person. And what does that speak to? That doesn't speak to God's judgment. It speaks to God's compassion and mercy. He was going to save them. 
So when we have people, religious people want to say, well, you know, Iowa City is just like Sodom and Gomorrah. Good. I said good. Because where sin doth abound, grace doth much more abound. If this is as a wicked a place as they want to say, you should be shouting and rejoicing because that means you got a wide open opportunity to petition God on its behalf. Y'all ain't saying nothing this morning. God said, what are you going to say about the place you live? All right, let me keep going. So in my concluding verse, but the person who is united to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. That's what happened with Abraham. Abraham, the Bible says, believed God, and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. It means that Abraham didn't get saved in the traditional sense. Huh? So it goes on to say the person who's united to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Verse 18 says, shun immorality and all sexual looseness. I'm reading this from the Amplified Bible. Flee from impurity in thought, that's what Reverend Elgin was saying, in thought, word, or deed. He goes on to say any other sin which a man commits is one outside the body. But he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body, uh, against his own body. Do you not know that your body is the temple, the very sanctuary of the Holy Ghost who lives within you, whom you have received as a gift from God? You are not your own. The sin here, as, as egregious as it may be, homosexuality and lesbianism, Listen to me. Close your Bibles. Read it some more later. I'm done. But I'm going to finish on this note. As egregious as, as it may be, as distasteful as it may be to many of us, it is not any more distasteful to God than you going out here and, and lusting against something that doesn't belong to you. It is not any more uh, egregious to God than you going out here and taking something that doesn't belong to you. Huh? In God's eyes, sin is sin, to be clear. Paul writes and says the greatest problem with immorality, sexual immorality, and you notice he does not in this particular passage list what sexual immorality is. Can I tell you that sexual immorality can be as something as looking at a computer screen of images of, uh, as a male and you are married or you are, may not be married, and those images lead your heart down a path that you eventually will act out on? Hmm? I'm sorry. Somebody got to tell you. So in God's eyes, when we say, oh, you know, well, you know, I don't, I don't like this person or I don't like that person. It's all the same to God. You know why it's the same to God? Now, Paul brings a, brings a good point here. The problem with it, with it, with you having a, 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 a sexual immorality or looseness and you sin against your own body, which you ultimately are sinning against the temple of God. This body does not belong to you. You didn't create it. I don't care how you dress it up and all the makeup and all the other stuff you put on it. You know, you put all these nice clothes on it. It still is not yours. Huh? And to be clear, the only thing that you are called and required to do is steward it and manage it. So when it gets sick, you tell it, body. You are not sick. You are healed in Jesus' name. When it gets tired, you tell it, body. I will give you this many hours of rest, but we are getting up and we are going to do the will and the work of God. Body, you come into line with what God has said about you. But if you are out here putting your body through punishment, through sexual immorality, you might as well not even open your mouth. Because <clears throat> your body has no right, does not have to listen to you. <sighs> Hallelujah. But when, say when, when, you come to the point that the greatest thing I ever want is to just be in God's will to be obedient. I want to be like Abraham where my word says something. I want to be like where God says that by two immutable things, every word is established. If God says it and I say it, that should be enough to get the job done. God, the first thing I do is repent. Forever taking it upon myself to do my own will. God says, good, son. 
All right, come on. That's some stuff I want you to do. I didn't spend three hours confessing my sin. I didn't spend all this time crying. Oh, God. Oh, 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 oh God. I'm so sorry. And God looking at you like, okay. And when you finish, when you finish, we're going to talk. Huh? God, I'm sorry. It'd be like me telling my wife, you know, and I don't suggest any husbands do this, but she and I have been together long enough to know we don't, we don't spend a whole lot of time in anger towards one another because, you know what, anger don't get loving. Being at odds with one another don't get affection. She and I like to walk down. We walk down the street holding hands. Some of y'all, y'all too cool for that. Okay, keep getting older. <laughs> Do you love the Lord this morning? Yes. Did y'all get anything out of that? Yes. Hallelujah. Come on, just lift your hands to the Lord.